You're listening to STEM XM, where women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics share their stories of success, overcoming barriers, and breaking the glass ceiling. And now, your host, Mel the Engineer. Hey everyone, I'm so glad you're here with us today. We've got a transportation engineer, Miss Jessica Rodriguez Gomez, with us on the show. She's had about a 30 year career in transportation roadway design, which is pretty amazing. Transportation engineering, you may know, is a subdiscipline of civil engineering. And at the time she went into this field, I suspect there were even fewer women in engineering. Ms. Gomez is currently a senior project manager for the consulting firm Friesen Nichols, and she's going to talk about some of the differences between what it's like to work for a state department of transportation versus working for a consulting business in that field. So let's get right into it, and I'll be back with you at the end to wrap up and discuss show notes. Thank you, Jessica, for joining us on STEM XM. Welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. I appreciate being here. So you are a transportation engineer. Can you tell us kind of a 2000 foot view down? What does a transportation engineer do? Well, um, in my, my precise field of transportation is actually, um, highway design, uh, highway and roadway design. So, what I've done throughout my career is uh, produce um, design construction plans for, um, uh, especially for textile, for the Department of Transportation here in Texas, uh, but also for a lot of cities and counties. Um, so it can be anywhere from a large interstate type project to uh, a local street that's that's being improved. So. Um, that's, that's my field of transportation. And, and as part of that, uh, as part of being a project manager for a transportation project, uh, you know, I, I oversee and, um, coordinate a lot of efforts, uh, related to environmental and structural, um, hydraulics, um, you know, any, any number of special specialty designs that, that we need for our roadway projects. Okay. And in transportation engineering, it sounds like there's some other paths that you can end up on. What would those be? Um, some transportation engineers focus on, on what we call traffic modeling, um, which is, or from the truly the traffic perspective, which is kind of like generating, uh, using software to, to, um, um, generate anticipated traffic volumes, um, and either that or actually like designing traffic signals. Um, so the, the traffic volumes is, uh, kind of from a planning perspective. And of course, all of that information is, is our, is done early in a project. And <clears throat> as part of our design, our actual design work for the roadway, we use that information that the traffic modelers um, will will do early on in the <clears throat> excuse me early on in the project. Uh, so we just need you know we're trying to figure out they're trying to figure out like how many cars are actually going to be using this particular road or this particular intersection in 20 years. So that when we design it, we're designing it for uh, for the future and not just to address you know today's uh, demand. When you go to school for for this particular field, is there a transportation engineering degree, or do you have to do it as a specialization of civil engineering? Um, so when I went to school, I was which was many years ago. Uh, I just got a general uh, civil engineering degree. Uh, you know, at, at my school, we you know we did have a transportation class, but we also had structural. Um, you know, we, we also had a materials class. We did environmental, um, like water and wastewater classes. So it was just general, uh, you know, I just, I ended up where, where I am in my, um, career just because that's the job that I got, um, during school. And, and then once I graduated, uh, you know, I was working for the department of transportation and obviously that's what we focused on was the design of roadways. So, 
Um, I didn't specifically uh, focus on that and really in school didn't, um, wasn't aware that that was what I was going to do. I just, my work kind of led me in that direction. Um, but um, I, and I think in some universities you can take more classes related to traffic, um, but you know, those would be, uh, those would be um options and, and uh, what do they call them? electives. So those would be electives instead of focusing in on structural design, maybe uh, you would focus on the transportation side. So how did you decide to go into this particular field? How did you know that, or how did you get, start down the civil engineering path to begin with? So to start in civil engineering, uh, it, w- it was really quite interesting. Um, because, uh, you know, ne- neither of my parents graduated from college. So uh, my brother had been through college, uh, but he, he was a, a music major. So when I went to college, uh, one of my high school counselors had told me, you know, she's like, well, what are you going to major in? And uh, I told her, so I, I don't really know. And she said, well, you know, you're pretty good in math and science. And she said, so engineering would probably be a good field for you. So um, when I went to <laughs> when I went to um, register for college, um, you know, I went to the, to sign in, and I told them I was going to major in engineering, and they said, "Well, which engineering?" And I and I was like, "What? What do you mean, which engineering?" I, I had no clue. I just I really didn't have any idea. So she rattles off, a, you know, four or five options of engineering, and uh, the only one that 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 was even remotely recognizable to me was electrical. So I just picked electrical. Well, after my first semester of school, um, I I quickly realized that electrical was not what I wanted to do. And so I signed up for an intro to civil engineering. Um, Not even sure why I picked that one, but I did. Uh, And again, just kind of by chance, you know, I got in the class, they, they did a really big overview of all the options within civil engineering. And I, I thought, you know, really most any of them would be interesting to me. Um, so that's that's how I, I changed over to civil and, and stuck it out. And that's that's where I ended up. Wow, that's that's really amazing. Do you mind me asking what year it was that that you were in high school and had this conversation with your counselor? Yeah. So I graduated from high school in 1981. Um, I was actually in a private Catholic school, so it was pretty small. There were less than a hundred of us that graduated in my class, and in that school, you know, I think it's you know the, we, the statistic was, you know, ninety-eight or ninety-nine percent of us went to college and and you know graduated with degrees. So, uh, you know, I always knew I was going to college. I, I just didn't really know. Um, actually, my first love is, is animals. And, um, so I always thought that I wanted to be a veterinarian. Uh, and then the, the older I got and the more I thought about, I thought, you know, I just, I couldn't deal with the heartache of sick animals. I just love them so much. So, um, so when, you know, the counselor was talking to me about what school and what I wanted to do, uh, like I said, I just, I really didn't have an idea. And, and she, she just, you know, was looking at my, my grades and kind of what I excelled at and, and just, kind of just said the word engineering and it just stuck. And I thought, okay, I guess that's, that sounds interesting. So that, that was 19, you know, before my graduation in 1981. Wow. Yeah, that's great. I think that's a testament to how much of an influence guidance counselors can have. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so after earning your bachelor's degree, um, I want to make sure I get the timeline right. So did you have an internship with TechSTOT? Is, is that where you went directly after earning your bachelor's degree? Yes. So actually, during, I guess between my, let's see, between my sophomore and junior year, um, I worked for TechSTOT during the summer. And I was trying to recall even how I, you know, I must have had a friend that told me that they hired, you know, engineering students uh, for, for the summer so um, I, I worked for them for two summers between sophomore, junior, and junior and senior year. And I was actually out in the construction uh, field with them. So I was out uh, every day uh, inspecting projects, uh, you know, roadway projects that were being constructed. Um, and I absolutely loved it. I loved being outside. I loved the construction side of it. Um, and it was just, it was a great organization. So 
uh, during my second summer with them, uh, you know, they, they knew I was graduating that, that, uh, following December and, uh, told me that they would, you know, that they wanted to offer me a, you know, permanent full-time job, uh, starting in January after I graduated. So, uh, that's what I did. I, I graduated in December and then in the Jan January of, um, 1986, I, uh, I joined them full time. And again, I went back out to the construction field and was out there for a few years, uh, before I transferred into the design office and, um, and did, and then started my design, uh, you know, experience there. Okay. I, I have this vision of, uh, in my head of how this kind of worked. So I, I want to ask you if this is correct. So you're working for TechStot and some consultant has, uh, done a highway design and TechStot has, uh, hired, um, a constructor, s some other company that, that is a contractor to build this. And so you were out on the construction site as a TechStot representative to make sure that things were done right and done to the quality standards of TechStot. Is, is that kind of how it goes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and back then, actually, the, the design work was being, you know, TechStot staff was actually doing design work. Um, you know, it was it was uh, it was when the consultants were starting to to do some of the TechStot design. But but back then, really, the, the bulk of it was being done in-house. Um, but yes, the, the, the project, the specific project that I was working on was designed by an outside consultant. And, uh, you know, TechStot has a, a, a whole book of specifications and requirements. So our job as inspectors was to make sure that they were being, you know, that everything that the contractor did was being done to, to TechStot specifications. Um, we did a lot of material testing. So we would make concrete beams to make sure that the concrete uh, was, uh, again, to specifications so that it obtained the strength within the time frame and and to the certain psi that was needed or whatever material we happened to be testing at the time but we did we did some of that out in the field uh but the the large part of it was uh you know referring to the plans and making sure that the contractor was building what was in the plans and to the specifications for each item so today um I'm not as familiar with, with how transportation works. Today, do more consulting firms do the design now? or do Yes, absolutely. Okay. So, so that's what I am. I'm a consultant now. Uh, I, made the, I made the change uh, several years ago, many, many years ago. So after spending 11 years with TechStot, um, I, I was hired on by a private consulting firm. Uh, basically, so I was doing the same work. I was designing roadways and uh, in, in various parts of, of the state. Uh, but today, definitely, I would say, you know, I, I don't know what the official percentage is, but the large bulk of, of um, design is done by, by the private consulting world. Okay. And you went back for a master's degree. Can you tell us about uh, the decision to do that and why you did that? And was it helpful to you? Yeah. So again, you know, my, my career has just kind of been a lot of, a lot of, uh, just, you know, things that happened that kind of made me, uh, that have led me to where I've been, uh, just really been very blessed in, in many ways. Um, so when I was in getting my bachelor's degree, um, you know, I, I always thought, well, I want to come and get my master's, but, um, didn't really know, didn't really know why. I just, it was more of a personal thing that I thought, you know, wanted to, I guess, maybe prove to myself I could do that as well. So before I graduated, I actually took the exam uh, for um, the master's, uh, you know, degree and had passed it and just kind of set that aside. But I went to work full time. And um, during the project that I was working on, we actually had a, we had a problem. We had an issue with um, some, um, concrete overlays that we were doing on some bridges, they started cracking and, and breaking off, you know, very soon after, uh, we opened it to traffic. So obviously it was not, uh, was, wasn't supposed to happen that way. So, um, 
I'm I'm not sure how, but one of the uh, one of the um, professors from from UTEP came out with some equipment that he had to do some testing to kind of help us try to figure out what, why this cracking was occurring and what we needed to do to, to repair it. And, um, so I was out there, got to meet him and he, you know, he said, Hey, he said, have, have you ever just, have you ever thought about coming back and getting your master's degree? And this was about five years after I graduated, uh, or I guess maybe three or four years. Yeah. About three years after and I told him, I said, well, actually, you know, I, I did, I had always thought about doing it, but you just haven't gotten around to it. So anyway, long story short, I actually got to go back to school um, to do research uh, based on this, this real problem that we had out in the field uh, and, and did my thesis on, on the research that we did. And um, so the first year of my master's program, I was uh, working full time, going to school in the evening, and then the second year I went to school full time, uh, and actually uh, went. TechStot had a master's program, so I went to talk to my district engineer and I asked him, uh, you know, I'd like to go back to school full time for this last year so I can do my thesis and finish my research, and um, and they they sponsored me, so so basically they. Um, they paid the university or, so that the university could pay me uh, like a, you know, kind of like a research assistant. So I still had income. I could still live uh, and, and still, you know, then go back to school full time. Uh, and then I, I finished my thesis and finished my uh, master's degree and went back uh, to TechStot after that. Um, as far as whether it's helped me or not uh, within my career, um, you know, I, I guess in the field that I'm in, I really can't say that, uh, you know, so, that I was maybe hired or promoted over somebody because I had a master's degree. Um, I think, um, uh, I think that from, um, you know, obviously the experience of, of doing some research, um, and really just, um, just kind of, gaining uh, confidence within myself because I was able to do that, uh, that, you know, it, it just, uh, it helped me from a personal um, perspective as far as confidence and, uh, you know, just being proud of myself that I was able to do it. Uh, so um, I, I think that's how it's helped me more, more so than anything. Okay, great. I, I, for our listeners, I want to point out a couple of things. So you mentioned UTEP, and that's University of Texas in El Paso, correct? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. And then uh, I also wanted to point out that I've had a lot of students ask if they should go back for a master's. And, and I always say that um, don't do it immediately after your bachelor's degree. Wait, like work a few years and then go into it. And precisely because of what you described, um, you know, working a little bit can help guide you in terms of uh, which specialty area you want to go into. But also there's still employers out there that have uh, different types of support programs for uh, going back for your master's. And it's, you know, it's obviously great if you can get employer support to do it versus paying for it uh, out of pocket. And then also, you r did a thesis on real-world work that, that you encountered in, in your own day-to-day -day work, and that, that still happens now. That's, a, in fact, a great way to uh, find and get backing for research today. So that's, that's really awesome that that worked out the way it did. Yeah. Yeah. And I definitely think, yeah, you know, being out and, and cause I, like I said, you know, I'm, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do in my career or with my career. And, um, so oftentimes, you know, I was a lucky one in that what I landed in first was something that I really enjoyed and, and learned to, uh, just really, really just, you know, hit me where I, where I wanted to be and, and allowed me to be there. But I know of, you know, a lot of young, uh, engineers that, you know, like get a job and, and, and it's just as important. They find out that's not exactly what they want to do. And then they, you know, look elsewhere, uh, which is good that, that, that you need to find something, um, that really, uh, is 
interesting to you because, I mean, quite honestly, most of us are going to be doing it for many, many years, you know, until we're able to retire. So you might as well enjoy it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I absolutely agree that, you know, uh, I know our, our company, the company I work for, they, they do also help financially with, with, um, people that are going back for, uh, for their degrees. Um, so it, it's definitely a, a financially a, a great, great way to, to approach, um, you know, the master's program. Yes, absolutely. Um, then I wanted to ask you, you, you worked for TechSTOT and now you work in consulting and usually there's qu- uh, quite a big difference between working for a government entity versus, um, you know, a private company or a publicly traded company, um, non-government work. Could you talk to us about how you find those two settings different and maybe some pros and cons? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, they, they're definitely very different. Uh, you know, and again, um, back when I made the transition, um, you know, again, consulting consultants were really just starting to do a lot of work for TechSTOT. But from a you know government standpoint, I, I, I remember the things that you know as be- becoming a consultant that were new to me that really I had never thought of, never had to uh, deal with, never really had to think about. Um, you know, as as a government uh, uh, employee, we had our jobs. You know, we we had target deadlines, and I you know use use the term target very loosely. Um, they weren't as stringent about, you know, whether we got them a specific time frame or we didn't. But, you know, there, there were definitely some requirements in that regard. Um, but, you know, there was never the financial side of it as far as the financial tracking of how much money and time you were actually spending doing the design. So uh, and then obviously the marketing perspective was not was not required. We just, we had a job and when that job was done, we got another, well, I should say we had a project. And when that project was done, we got another project. And sometimes we were working on two or three projects at the same time. Um, so as a consultant, it is very, uh, quite different in that, you know, again, the, so, so now you're responsible, um, for, you know, you have a very specific budget for, um, how much time and money you can spend on the design. You have a very specific deadline, uh, so the client is expecting your your design to be completed by you know X date, uh, and it has to be met. Um, so that's very different. And and as a private company, uh, and I've worked for you know privately held, and I've worked for um, publicly traded firms as well. Uh, and it's both. It's important to both of them uh, in the same way. It just depends on how the firms handle, uh, you know, the, or there's just different approaches to making sure that financially the projects make money. So they're given a certain pot of money to design a project. And it just depends on how, um, you know, how, how quickly and how well you design, whether you're going to make the company some money or you're going to lose money. Um, so that's definitely a big uh, part of being a consultant um, and, you know, for, I've seen a lot of people make that transition from government to public. Uh, and quite honestly, some folks can do it and some folks can't. Some folks find that very unnerving and very, you know, just very challenging. Um, so I would say definitely the, the financial part of managing a project is very, very different than from a governmental standpoint. Uh, the other big one is marketing, obviously. So as a, as a government um, employee, again, you know, your projects just show up. Nobody has to go out looking for them. They're, they're there. Somebody within the organization is programming, you know, which projects go next. And, uh, and so that's, that's how your work comes to you at your desk. Um, in a, mar- in a um, consultant world, uh, marketing is a huge part. So we have to, we have to go looking for work. We have to, we have to market our firm and our services. Um, and, and we compete against every other consultant that's out there. That's wanting to do the same, you know, it could be one project that maybe, 
you know, 25 to 30 firms are pursuing. And we write proposals um, to, um, you know, to be reviewed and, and then the clients select based on the proposals and or um, interviews. So we do a lot of face-to-face -face interviews, again, to, um, to uh, describe the services that we do and to show that we're better than the other 24 companies that are chasing it or the other, uh, the other the three or four firms that they're interviewing. Uh, so a lot, a lot of um, uh, competition and a lot of, you know, um, responsibility um, to, to go out and win work to keep you and your employees and the firm busy. Uh, so um, again, you know, some people find that exciting. Some people, you know, are, are, you know, step up to that challenge and maybe some folks aren't quite cut out for that. So I definitely think that, you know, you need to um, kind of evaluate, you know, what, what it is that you're willing to do that you want to do. Uh, I've been a consultant, let's see, for, oh my gosh, 18. Yeah, I think for 18 years now. Uh, and uh, seen the industry change a lot as well. But again, that those two big elements that are different from the government have never changed. Um, but again, they're, they're a lot of fun too. You know, they're, they're a lot of fun and can push you and challenge you into uh, territory that you probably never thought you, you could do or would do. Absolutely. I, th I think when people he who are not familiar with the engineering world as a field, when they think engineering, they don't think about the, the business side or marketing side so much. And my experience in school was that, you know, for a bachelor's degree in engineering, they don't really touch so much on the business side and certainly not um, marketing or sales or anything like that. I think we had one required economics class where we did some, you know, engineering financial analysis and that was really it. So for, for our listeners, maybe for um, a young listener who's interested in going into this field and they want to get a, a leg up, so on maybe going into the consulting world, would you have any specific recommendations for them? Um, you know, again, in, when I went to school, I mean, I never took a business class, you know, we, we did too. We had an engineering economy class that I, that, that was the only thing related to money that I ever remember being taught. Um, and really quite honestly, I don't even remember what we learned in that, in that class, but uh, I just remembered taking it. Uh, I, and, you know, I know a lot of a lot of uh, students nowadays think that, you know, oh, taking, you know, being getting a degree in business as well uh, might be might be a, a huge advantage. Uh, you know, I would say that, um, you know, if your school offers a, a class and, and maybe maybe the universities are getting better at, at having that opportunity for for students to kind of just you know, learn what it is to, um, you know, how, how budgets are, are maybe put together. And, um, but I would say probably, you know, those are the kinds of things that you learn because each firm, um, even they, you know, they, they monitor different, um, aspects of, or, or they even calculate, you know, their, their financials differently. Again, I've worked for a few different firms and, seems like every one of them, they use a different software and they have different project management um, softwares that we use to track our, our spending. Um, so that's very specific to the companies that you, that you might work for. Um, and, you know, I would just say, I think I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of young engineers come up behind me and, and have become really good project managers and, um, but I think a lot of that financial and even the marketing standpoint really comes from watching and learning um, from your, you know, from your bosses and the people that, that you, um, that you work for and with, um, you know, I would say probably for me, the most important thing was working, um, working 
for people that were willing to, you know, to, to take you to a, a marketing call and you just sit there. You don't even, you don't even get to say anything, you, but you sit and you watch and you listen um, when you're in social gatherings, like at a conference, for, uh, uh, for instance, uh, you listen to people talking to one another. Uh, again, you kind of watch your bosses and hopefully they're, they, they're mentors to you. Uh, and they're, they're probably very good at what they do at that stage in their career. Um, and so you, you pick up, you know, you learn from watching and listening. Uh, and from the financial standpoint, you know, being, um, you know, asking, say, hey, can I, you know, can I help you or can I, can I do the project monthly reports? Uh, you know, show me how to do it. Show me what you're looking for. Um, and, and just, you know, again, taking advantage of those around you that are doing it and that do it well uh, and kind of learning, um, learning that way. Did you ever have a mentor or someone in engineering that kind of took you under their wing and uh, could you talk to us about that and how they helped you? Yeah. So my, um, I guess my, my, my first mentor, um, obviously I've had a few through the years, but really, uh, the one I consider, you know, my real mentor, um, from day one was, was my boss at TechStot. Um, when, you know, once I graduated and became a full-time employee, I was working on a project that, that he was managing. He, um, he was our, uh, we used to call them resident engineers at the time. And, uh, you know, I remember him like just, uh, again, just throwing things at me and saying, Hey, you, you need to do this. You need to do that. And, and, and I was like, well, well, but Rich, I, I don't, I don't know how to do that. I said, Oh, you'll do fine. You, you, you can do this. Um, and so he gave me a whole lot of opportunity, had just a tremendous amount of confidence in me, confidence that I didn't even have in myself, that I didn't even know I was capable of doing the things that he was asking me to do. Um, but again, you know, just pushing my, my comfort level, uh, and, and then just having all the confidence in me in the world and then, and then obviously supporting me. So if I needed help, if I had questions, uh, was always available to me, uh, to, you know, to help me think something through, not just throw out the answer, but help me think it through. Um, and so he was, uh, a huge, um, you know, impact to, to me, to personal growth and, and my professional growth. Um, and then, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate and worked with a lot of other great, um, people <clears throat> throughout my career, uh, that, you know, that I've learned from. And I always tell people that I've actually, you know, learned there, there are things that you, uh, learn from people that you might not agree with how they handle things. So, you know, I, I worked for a, a boss at one time for a short time um, that I didn't like the way that he handled certain things in the office. And that was a learning experience because I thought that's not how I'm going to do it. You know, I don't I don't like it and I don't want to do that to anybody in the future. Um, so uh, um, I think, again, learning the good things and then also learning the things that maybe don't set with you very well. Uh, from from everybody that's around you, but uh, definitely a mentor is somebody who's going to um, support you and push you and uh, just and help you to uh, develop your your technical skills, your thinking skills, your public skills um, in you know in all different kinds of ways. When you worked with Rich at TechStot, that was in the late '80s, right? Uh, yes. Uh -huh, yes. And at that time, I think you mentioned you were the only woman engineer in that office. Is that right? Yes. I was the only female engineer in, in the, the whole, the El Paso district. So the entire El Paso text dot district, there were no other female engineers except me. So it's, you know, first I want to say it was great that Rich was there and he really helped and, and, you know, did what a good leader should do. But I want to ask, were there any times that you encountered difficulty being the only woman engineer there? Um, I think more so uh, just 
you know, um, it actually, for me, I think it was, it was real, it was somewhat of a benefit in that, you know, everybody knew of me or about me just because of the fact that, you know, they were like, wow, there's a woman engineer and the fact that I was in construction. So I think from a lot of perspectives, it was just something that was very obvious and people, you know, you couldn't miss the fact that I was out in construction. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think because, because Rich, um, really supported me and, and, you know, everybody knew that and everybody, everybody that knew Rich was, you know, I mean, he was just a great man to, to everybody. And so a high, high level of respect from him, from, from everybody at the district that was working in construction. And so because he had that for me, I think they, they were like, oh, wow, I guess, you know, you know, this Jessica, I guess she's the real thing, you know, she can really do what she's supposed to be doing. Um, and being out in the field and working with, um, all the other male inspectors, um, none of, none of which were engineers, they were, they were inspectors and had been out in construction for many, many years. Um, you know, I just, I pulled my weight. I did what I was asked to do. I asked to do other things that maybe they weren't initially asking me to do. Um, and I think that, just, you know, showing that I didn't expect any special uh, accommodations or uh, I didn't expect to have to do something that all the other inspectors were having to do, you know, whether it was working, you know, from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, I did my shifts of, of, you know, midnight work and um, I stayed late, you know, when the contractor was pouring concrete till seven or eight o'clock at night. I stayed, you know, even having started our days at 7 a.m. Um, so I think I quickly, you know, showed that I was there. I was there to work just like everybody else. Uh, and that made a huge difference. Um, now, the contractors, on the other hand, you know, it's always new to them as well. So the contractors, you know, a lot of um, uh men that had been working in the field for a long time and seeing a woman out in the field was not something they were accustomed to. Um, and you know, just, they're different. Uh, some of them, uh, just, you know, thought that they didn't have to listen, you know, that, you know, my word wasn't as good as somebody else's, one of the other inspectors words. Uh, and again, that, that was dispelled very early on, uh, because I had the support of my coworkers and, uh, you know, if they didn't do what I asked them to do, I'd, I'd just pass that along to my chief inspector and he'd come out there <laughs> and he'd say, look, didn't Jessica tell you X, Y, and Z? And they're like, uh, yeah, okay, then do it, you know? And, and again, so over time they were like, okay, well, she's, you know, she's the real deal. We, we have to listen to her too. So, um, you know, that was, that was my experience in, in the construction and I think construction definitely a lot different than the design uh, field. Uh, so I kind of, you know, my skin was toughened early on having to deal with contractors. And so when I got to the design world, really, I didn't really encounter anybody that could be as intimidating as a contractor. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> well, you described several different things there that I, I think are really important. Um, so you you took the initiative to ask to take on uh, extra responsibilities. Uh, you developed thick skin uh, in dealing with these people. You, um, you know, used your chain of command and managers to help you get your point across when dealing with the contractors and, and whatnot. Those, those are some, you know, important, not, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Those are some por some important skills t uh, that you have internally that aren't technical skills that were important to develop and, and contributed to your success. Are there some other uh, strengths maybe that you would say are good for people going going into transportation engineering or, or working in construction? Um. I think, yeah, from definitely uh, working in construction. So a lot of the construction uh, work is, um, you know, is thinking on your feet. So, so being able to, um, you know, look, look at the issue at hand 
and, you know, kind of mentally going through, um, you know, what, what the problem is and then, and then thinking about uh, what you know about the project. So, so I, I always really think that what's important um, for really any engineer, whether it's design or, or you know, uh, addressing it in the construction field, is really knowing your project. Not, you know, I um, always feel like I've, I've run across some people that, you know, you might be designing the roadway. You might be establishing the, the geometric layout of it. Um, but it's, it's really important to have the interaction and, um, the discussions, you know, talking with your drainage people, talking with your environmental people, um, talking with your structural people to really just understand the project. Um, you know, and, and you don't have to be, you know, cause I'm, I am definitely, I'm not an expert in any of those fields, you know, um, but I, you know, I make it a point to learn enough about it so that if somebody uh, maybe says, hey, you know, maybe what if we just block this uh, creek here, you know, put some, uh, prevent the water from coming in. You know, I know enough to think, well, wait a minute, that might have some kind of impact from an environmental perspective or from our environmental permitting standpoint. Uh, and so, you know, again, I don't know for sure that it is, but I know enough to that it's going to raise a question in my mind. Um, so, uh, again, I think uh, making uh, making it a point to really know the project, kind of a holistic uh, understanding of the project and not just get so focused in on what you're doing, um, because I know that in, in, you know, in my field, is especially and I think really in, in any engineering field, um, communication is, is so, so important and, and, uh, and listening is a really important skill that a lot of us don't have, uh, and that a lot of us have to work on. So, um, you know, when you're, um, you know, when you're work, even in school, when you're working on projects, uh, like school projects and things, you know, th that, those are the times I think that's when you learn those types of skills to, to understanding what it means to work with somebody, to work through, to work with a group through a problem uh, and, and uh, you know, doing a fair share of listening and, and talking and sharing ideas. Um, so I think those are the kinds of skills that, that you can learn while you're in school, um, you know, working whether it's just doing homework or whether it's doing a, a project. You pointed out something interesting that uh, I'd like to highlight for our listeners. So um, for people who are not familiar with the entire process, they, they may not know how many disciplines have to come together to uh, make a project happen successfully, right? So um, so when a, a road or a highway is built, there's more than just laying down some asphalt where you want to. There's people that are involved um, from the environmental or biological side. And then like you mentioned, there's, um, you know, considerations to do with uh, water and where does water go and how do you drain water from the impervious road surface and those types of things. Um, could you talk to us maybe about a specific project that you worked on where um, you kind of saw this interaction and, and what describe maybe what all is involved, like what disciplines come together to make this happen? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because really um, it, it almost seems, especially nowadays, things have changed a little bit through the years, um, but it, it almost seems like regardless of the size of a project anymore, um, there are certain elements that, that are part of, of every project, it seems like. But obviously the bigger projects, uh, you know, that I've worked on, uh, you know, I've done a lot of uh, projects on interstate highways um, that, you know, I've done a, a few projects where uh, it's been a, an interchange, like, you know, where, where two or three highways come together and you have, you know, you have a three or four level interchange. Um, so a lot of structural um, elements, uh, part of those projects. But, um, 
Yeah, again, I, I would say, you know, in a big project like that, obviously structural engineering is a huge uh, part of that. So, so you know, we identify where the road's going to go. Um, we, we coordinate with our hydraulic people um, if, like, we're crossing a creek uh, or maybe even a bigger body of water. Um, so we have to be sure that we don't negatively impact the, the flow of the water um, and the huge part of that, you know, especially when we're working around areas that, that you know, there's a creek or a, or a, a, a lake or something like that nearby um, is the environmental side. So, uh, again, you, you don't even have to be around any kind of, quote unquote, natural environment like that. I mean, in, in environmental permitting is just a huge part of every project nowadays. Um, so we, you know, they're looking for. They're looking for uh, habitat, you know, natural habitat. Make sure that we don't negatively impact that. They're, they look at noise. They look at um, air quality. Um, so, um, you know, they're looking at, at, again, the actual crossing of the water um, that we're crossing, making sure that there's no, no negative impact there. Um, so the environmental side is, is just a, a big part of a lot of projects. Um, another thing that I have not mentioned before is again when you get into, I mean, if, obviously with it's your your projects are very public, right? So they're they're for the public, they're in the public, and then they obviously impact the public significantly. Um, so obviously, some more than others. So um, public involvement is a lot of a lot of a big part of what we do as well um, as part of engineering. Again, absolutely nothing to do with engineering, other than. You know, we, we go to public meetings. Sometimes we lead the meetings and we kind of we, we walk through the project and we describe what we're doing and why we're doing it and when we'll be doing it and how it will impact the people that live adjacent to the project or people that are just traveling through um, that particular corridor. Uh, sometimes we're just there to support, you know, maybe maybe let's say TxDOT's leading the, the, pro the uh, meeting, but we're there to answer questions we prepare the exhibits, um, so we have to make sure that they're something that's understandable to the general public. Uh, and so, again, and then when we're answering questions, you know, that we're not using all the technical lingo that, that you know, we transportation roadway engineers use to talk to one another, but that we're talking to, um, you know, to, to a grandmother or somebody that, that doesn't have that technical background and uh, but helping that person to understand uh, what we're doing and, and why we're doing it and to maybe, you know, address their specific concerns. So um, that's another big part that we, you know, we, we have people that specialize in public involvement, but definitely as an engineer, uh, you, you definitely have uh, interaction and you're definitely a part of that public involvement process and you, you have to be um trying to think what else environmental you know getting I mentioned structural uh you know obviously we have to coordinate with our structural engineers when we have bridges <clears throat> we coordinate with our hydraulic engineers uh if they're designing you know a storm drain system or even if it's just a ditch uh, we have to uh, make sure that the roadway and the drainage work together um I think those are some of the, the ones that I, I guess a lot of projects recently that I've actually been working on. Actually, we we have a utility aspect to them, too. So we're reconstructing an old roadway and all the utilities have been there for, you know, 50, 60 years or so. And so it makes sense for us to be upgrading those utilities at the same time that we're going to be reconstructing the road. So, you know, we're dealing with our water and wastewater design engineers uh, and making sure that we can get everything to fit within a specific right of way width. And um, so we have a lot of constraints to work in. Uh, a lot of uh, another thing that I do a lot, I've been doing a lot here recently, is even the right of way acquisition. So we figure out how much right of way we need. Um, we, we, we talk again, we're talking specifically to the property owners uh, of that we're acquiring right of way from, <clears throat> telling them what we're doing and why we need it. And and, and helping the right-of-way people negotiate with those property owners. Uh, again, sometimes it's it's creating an exhibit so that, you know, specific to their property and how close is the road going to get to their house or how, 
how is it going to impact their driveway? Um, you know, any number of questions and concerns that they have, we we help the uh, right away agents to um, to work through those those questions and those concerns. Yeah, that's you just talked about so many great things that that <laughs> I I want to highlight really quickly. Um, so communication is definitely an important part of your work and uh, being able to communicate to different audiences is important. Uh, so that's, that's something that I think some engineers I've met didn't realize when they went through engineering school that there would be this pretty big communications component to, the, to their work. And then um, you mentioned several different disciplines, and I'll, I'll put links with information to some of these disciplines in the, in the show notes. But uh, I wanted to point out that structural engineering and the, the hydraulics or the stormwater uh, and drainage work that you mentioned, those are oftentimes both uh, branches within civil engineering. And then you mentioned the uh, air pollution consideration that happens. That's something that's oftentimes handled by an environmental engineer. That's that's one a subdiscipline of environmental engineering, uh, as well as public health. And then you mentioned uh, noise studies, and, and I actually don't know who, who handles that kind of work. I know that in the industrial setting, uh, industrial hygienists will, will oftentimes handle um, noise studies. Do you know who does that in, in the transportation realm? I mean, I think just um, trying to think, uh, you know, <clears throat> a lot of it is it, our, our companies that just, you know, have the noise monitoring equipment, uh, right. And they, they, they set up monitors at different locations and, um, and then determine like whether a, a noise wall is needed or, um, things like that. But I, I don't know that, I don't know what specific discipline or if, if, if there is a specific discipline or if it's more of a, like a technical, um, field, you know, that, that this, they know how to operate the equipment. They know how to interpret, interpret the data, um, but yeah, unfortunately, I don't specifically know, of, you know, it's, it just, it's part of, again, the whole bigger environmental piece that, that we have to look into. So yeah, absolutely. No worries. So it's, it's still a, a information that comes in and, and it's used to help develop and, and, uh, have decision making on the, the ultimate design of, of the roadway or the, or the highway. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and then. I met, I, of course, I'm in Florida, so it, it may be kind of different here, um, but I met a biologist here who worked for a consultant. He works for a consulting company um, that does transportation, and he goes in and kind of does like the environmental impact assessment, and he says, okay, well, you're displacing um, all of these plants here, and these are maybe endangered or important to the Florida ecosystem in some way. So if you're displacing it here, you have to go and plant more over here in this other place. So there's even, you know, this other kind of branch of science that, that comes into this. And, and as you pointed out, it's tied to uh, environmental permits and, and rules in the, um, in the district or the state that the, the project is happening in. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, yeah, like you mentioned plants and stuff, you know, we definitely a project that I'm working on right now, you know, we, we're going to have to do tree mitigation because we're clearing the right of way. And, and, and so our surveyors go out there and they collect all the information on, on, on the the trees, you know, what size, you know, where, where are they? And then, you know, there's a, there's a rule, there's a law that says, okay, if you're knocking down X number of inches of tree trunk, this is, this is what you have to mitigate. And so then as part of our project, uh, you know, we have a landscape um, architect on our project, on our team that, okay, here, this is how many uh, inches of trees we need to mitigate. And so they determine what type and where they'd like them planted um, so that we meet that requirement. Um, yeah, that's great. Oh, man, we covered a lot of good stuff today. Um, I want to th- thank you again for taking the time and coming on to the show Uh before we wrap up, is there anything else that you'd like to share with the STEM XM listeners? Any uh, last minute kind of advice for maybe some young people out there that are thinking about going into civil engineering and maybe they're interested in transportation engineering? 
Oh gosh, I mean, I would I would just say you know to um, to really you know not not be intimidated by uh, you know the engineering in general or specifically civil engineering. You know the large percentage of of men that make up that um, that you know that field. Uh, there are a lot of great guys, and I've been very fortunate. Most people that I've encountered have again been very supportive. Um, and, and just, you know, have confidence in yourself. Um, don't, don't be intimidated, but, but be, but be yourself, be, be who you are, um, be willing to work hard like everybody else. And, and I think just doing that, um, you know, people will quickly learn to respect you, uh, and admire you for, you know, for being who you are and, and, and being willing to help name and not not because you're a woman expecting any type of special treatment i think that just goes a long long way uh in in how people will perceive you great thank you so much oh you're very welcome and that concludes our talk today with jessica i hope you learned a lot from this episode And if you've got any questions you want to ask, head on over to stemxm.com to get in touch with us or tweet to us at stemxm podcast. You can find today's show notes at stemxm.com slash episode three. That's S-T-E-M-X-M dot com forward slash episode and then the number three. I wanted to mention that there will be another interview coming up soon with a transportation engineer named Patty Valoy. Patty has not been in the field as long as Jessica, and she's in a slightly different area of transportation engineering working out of New York City, so be on the lookout for that episode. If you'd like to help support the show, you can do so by going to stemxm.com slash Amazon and clicking on the Amazon, Audible, or Kindle links there. Any type of purchase you make after clicking through one of those links will give StemXM a small commission, which helps support the show's efforts. Thanks for downloading, and remember, whatever your dream is in a STEM career, you can accomplish it. Thanks for listening, and we'll chat again in episode four. This has been an episode of the STEM XM podcast. Thank you for listening. We would really love if you could pop over to iTunes and give us an honest, positive rating. It helps more listeners find us to learn about STEM careers. Thanks again, cheers, and we'll catch you on the next episode.